Actually, we're going to start. Can we, um, can we call a meeting, Dory? I just realized it is 6.30. Yeah, like a lie on the wall. Sure. <laughs> 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 yes, yes. Gene Fox? Here. Sherry, uh, sorry. Steve Owen? Here. Sherry Barron? Here. Robert Clark? Here. Derek Gracia? Here. Laura Ramston? Here. Will Sanklitz is not here. Steven Sylvia? Here. All right. Uh, ugh. Would you please join me? Oh, who's here? Lloyd Cam, anybody else recording the meeting? All right, thank you. Uh, join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, I pledge, pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, anyone here for public participation? Just thought I'd ask because just it's on the agenda. You got to ask a question. <laughs> Acceptance of minutes from the twenty second of January. Do I have a motion? So moved. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. A motion to second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Um, Oh, we're already up to you guys. That was quick. <laughs> so we, have, we have presentations to the school committee from Mr. Pacheco and Mr. Wilson. All right. So the class of 2020 parents and guardians attended a scholarship information night. This past week, it was officiated by Ms. Nicole Graff, and she will be going around classes this week to give it to the students. <coughs> RHS's fourth annual career and college day event was a huge success. Students in grades 9 through 11 attended three presentations from among 45 local presenters. Attendees heard from professionals about their personal career narrative. Thank you to Mrs. Fontaine, Mrs. Cronin, and the whole guidance department for an excellent learning opportunity. Next week kicks off our Dude Be Nice Week celebration at Aponiquit. Dude Be Nice is an annual event here at Aponiquit where we celebrate kindness. This year, the Student Council will be hosting a fundraiser raffle at lunch in order to raise money for, its, for this year's cause, the Usher Syndrome Coalition, which raises money to fight Usher Syndrome, a condition that causes, causes people to lose hearing and sight as they grow older. In addition to fundraising at lunch, we'll be celebrating each class <laughs> color every day. Our hope is that every student and staff member will wear that day's color in order to show support for their grade. Please save the date for the Spring Parent and Guardian Night scheduled for Thursday, March 19th, 2020. Parent-teacher conferences will be running from 6 to 8 p.m. The Aponico players are busy preparing for our upcoming spring musical Broadway nights on March 26th, 27th, and 28th at 7 p.m. Congratulations to our 161 DECA students for representing ARHS at the DECA District 8 Conference. 62 students earned a medal for ranking top in their test or role play. 53 students qualified for the state conference with a top 7 ranking in their category. And an additional 11 students ranked in the top 10 in their category. On Saturday, January 11th, Student Council and the Life Skills Program teamed up to attend the an annual Unified Bocce event at Walpole High School, hosted by MASC and the Special Olympics. At the event, students teamed up with Unified Athletes to have a day of bocce filled fun. And journalism students had the pleasure of interviewing Al and Nancy Foster. The Fosters, both Aponica graduates, reminisced about their high school days and reflected on life as teenagers in the 1960s. Details of the conversation will be included as part of a then and now feature in the upcoming Polarian 60, 60th edition. Thank you very, very much. <coughs> Lots of stuff going on, I guess, huh? Thanks. You don't have to later. <laughs> Thank you so much. I thought they were giving the budget presentation. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, I think they're going to go over there yeah, so they can cool. give a better... No, they're out of here. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, old business with class size transportation staffing updates. Mrs. Fox, yes, informational items, uh, class size. You can see the numbers reflected from January to February, but a little, very little. Actually, there was a change of about nine additional students. Um, but if you go back to the original September right. uh, date, we're basically consistent with where we start, which is pretty typical. Mm -hmm. See the numbers are, I don't know if there are any specific questions. Um, I've also included for this month, because we had a little lapse in the, the transportation numbers as well. Yes. Which the you. bus numbers are there. Although uh, you do need some glasses to see the, yeah, the transportation the numbers a little bit. Yeah, I noticed that. The could be a little larger. Mr. Owen. Um, um, going back to class size? Don't, yes, yeah. please. Um, to try to be creative here, um, if we were to combine the classes 
a grade one at AES and a grade one at FES, you know, there's a little bit offset. I guess my question is, is there anything preventing us that those that may be in Lakeville but on the Freetown side, closer to FES, that they could not attend elementary school over there? Well, there's nothing that prohibits students attending other than transportation issues. Which could be big. Which could be. So I'm mean, obviously we'd have to. Yeah, and, yeah. and it, there may not be yep. numbers to support that. I'm just, yeah. you know, this. We yeah. have we've had a couple of certain certain. So in my six years, we have had a couple of instances where a family moved from one town yes. to the other and yep. wanted to remain yep. in that school, which made total sense. Um, yeah. They don't become school of choice though, because technically they're still within our district, district yeah. and we have allowed that to take place with the understanding the family had to uh, address transportation. Yeah, they moved into the Freetown piece. So I, I am, it hasn't been something we've looked at systematically. It certainly is something we could we could take a look at. It's quite disparate. Well, it is, it's and it's just that, especially where some of these neighborhoods are popping up. Yeah, you know what I mean. The thought is more families are in there. <laughs> if it's more of a, they're ultimately going to be together anyway. So just Correct. more out logistically, some of these families go further to travel to get to AES. Than it would be to get to FES, even though they live in Lakeville or vice versa. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, you make a good point. There's quite a yeah, I, I mean, I, the question really remains: Do we want those to, those to be family decisions, or do you want those to be school decisions? It could be a little different if they're sure. if you're taking neighborhoods and you know, for example, Baker, over here on Lakeville, technically, it is actually probably closer. That's my point. To right? Elementary and school. If you take five or six students and. But, uh, so obviously, the decision was a little bit easier when we weren't fully regionalized, but now that... But. To answer your question, see, we have not given formal consideration, but certainly if we have some disparity, we certainly could take a look at that. that's always going to be a difficult decision every year as class size, especially at the elementary yep. schools. Right. So, but, okay. Right. It was, it was good you brought it up. It could come up again when we have school choice decisions at our next meeting as well. Okay. Anything on the buses or class size? You have another one? We could have already done this, but... Uh, do we update the full as far as the bus change to offset the one route in Lakeville? We did. So that bus, so if you look, the Steve, Mr. Owens made a, actually he didn't make the request. A, a, there was concern about bus 20. So if you go back to the, the December date, you will notice bus 20 having a higher number of students. We did make an, we did address bus 20. Um, and there was a, a group of students who were, Riding bus 20 for child care purposes, we reassigned those within another bus and we're able to bring down and address some size issues. If, uh, what I typically have done, and I'm sure you probably do the same thing, I try to circle any of those buses that have 50 or more students right. and kind of identify whether there are before or care, after care program buses or there's some rerouting that, we, that can take place. Overall, I would say these numbers are, are, are pretty solid in comparison to the last couple of years. We've been able to address most of them. I. I continue to think that we're going to have to look at that when we start to look at some of those development, though. Right. And that's what's happening in some of those areas where there obviously are going to be increasing needs. We're going to have to redistribute some of the bus routes because mm -hmm. we have not built in, a little preview, any additional um, <laughs> buses for the coming year. Anyone else? Okay. I don't have a staffing update other than that we don't have any new positions, and obviously we're not looking at 21. Uh, positions until we get a little bit further along Correct. in the budget process. Right. Um, so, Please. Ashley, the 20 budget. Yep. Yep. Um, my report is actually in the back of the packet. Of um, just an update of the general fund revenue and expenditures. We're on target for um, this time of year. Um, we're going to continue to monitor utilities as we go through the winter and also um, substitutes it within our buildings. Uh, we're having a lot of conversations as an admin council, so we monitor that. Um, but if any, anything changes, I will keep you updated. The assessment sheet is also there for FY20. Uh, there have been no changes. So I think it's, you know, to Ashley's credit, or due diligence in relation to here we are in February, we're not sitting on, you know, budget freezes. I think there's been a lot of circumstances that have worked out real well in relation, and obviously we continue to monitor it, but right now it looks pretty solid. We are waiting for some potential supplemental monies. Um, oh, with, uh, <laughs> we don't have any information on the supplemental. There's been no update. They, they did say February, so. But it is February. 2020? <laughs> <or? laughs> so we're hoping to hear from them. We, we should hear soon, huh? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.
Um, new business. Um, mm -hmm. I do. So it's listed under A, uh, South Coast Educational Collaborative, just to, for oh, yeah, a, a very brief reminder. Um, we are members of two collaboratives, the Reeds Collaborative and the South Coast Educational Collaborative. I sit on both of those boards. So each year we have to take an annual vote. That's inclusive here as well, appointing me. But in addition, we have... Um, we're in, in the process of extending membership at South Coast. Reed's Collaborative, just for example, has 18 communities. South Coast historically had five or six. We've expanded a little bit to include some others. I can share with you kind of a geographic map. It's basically Southeastern Mass. They both um, say the same thing. One, is that right? One, 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 one is Westport, one is New West Bedford. Oh, I do, I do. I'm sorry. So it's the same. So, so, one of the, so okay. I can't combine them because they each need to take individual votes. Understood. So it is my recommendation um, as a board chair to vote in New Bedford and in Westport. Yeah, Westport. We need formal action, we have to take minutes, the chair has to sign. Mm -hmm. And so it is my recommendation to accept the motion as yeah. presented and you don't have to read the motion as far as you accept it that way. I have a motion. I'll make a motion to accept New Bedford as the South Coast, as presented. Would you do them separately? Yes, please. Okay, and I heard a second. Second. Right, okay. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? We'll move on to Westport. I'll make a motion to accept Westport Community District and the South Coast Education Collaborative as presented. Second. And a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carried. Mrs. Okay, Fox, I just may just add thank you very much. Each school committee that is a member of the collaborative has to take that same action. So that's what yeah. school committees will do in the coming months. And then that information, once all the committees have voted, goes to the commissioner. And ultimately, it's actually uh, DESI that approves uh, membership to a collaborative. Oh. But only after all committees and cities and towns have endorsed it. So that's what basically we're going to do over the next few months. It, it typically takes about one year for them to become official members. <laughs> Dartmouth recently joined as well, and you took that action about a year ago. It doesn't necessarily take the communities that long. <laughs> no, understood. <laughs> but for the whole uh, process, about a year. Thank you. I, thank you. I may yeah. recommend before the budget presentation, Keen, if you want, we could do the calendar first. Yeah, I that. will say that I had a question today, because um, it is already coming up out there about the um, pre and post Labor Day issue, uh, but it wasn't, oh my gosh, I have a vacation that week. It was the primary is September 1, First. and we don't want anyone in school then, and yeah. November 4, what is it, November 3rd, and so I see that that's yellow. So so both, if we, if we are going to address yes. the calendars, both calendars that you have in front of you, both 1 and 2, um, students would not be in session on September 1st in either Which instance. Which is what I told them, but I wanted to, us to all be on the okay. same page because that is important to people. And everyone agrees we're doing the calendar, right? So the other thing is we talked about um, we should potentially look at what a cutoff date would be or are we going to do pre-Labor Day every year? I mean, mm -hmm. we have to have that discussion as well. And I didn't get the feeling from this group that every year necessarily should be a pre-Labor Day start, but we need to have the discussion um, or alternatively pick a date. Like anything after the 5th means we start before Labor Day, something like that. So, I mean, uh, open it up to discussion on that, Sherry. Okay, so the policy um, committee met so right, committee right. Met just before this meeting. We went through IC-ICA school year school calendar. Um, which, in essence, says we need 180 days and right. 100 minutes and so forth. It does not, it, the MASC does not spell out anything as far as when it's Labor Day right. is. Um, I went through about 30 different communities' um, policy books. Mm -hmm. All of them have MASC. None of them state anything about Labor Day. Okay. Uh, like likewise. You want to go on with no, likewise. Same research. I did. I could, could not come across any districts that adopted policy specific to that. They pretty much adhere to either our existing policy and reference the date when you would make a decision by, or left it. Okay. Not even right. So no policy. So so the policy committee voted to adhere to the present policy mm -hmm. that we have right now and leave it up to the superintendent each year, with a suggestion that perhaps 
if there's any thought of going before Labor Day in particular that we would roll that out a little bit earlier than September, February. Fe right. February is our date that we will do it, but if we're able to, we could roll it out a little earlier. Because there is more and more, and this is the other thing this particular parent said to me, more and more school districts are consistently before Labor Day now. Yeah. So it's that they interesting because we have a um, one of our members is in the Quincy school system. Mm -hmm. they're, they're starting... I think I'm going to tell you something. They're starting the 8th, September 8th, the, nice. the city of oh, the 9th. You'll have a great 4th of July just out of school. <laughs> 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 so one would think that more people, more communities. More are, um, but it, in, in our instance, I think we were compelled to have this discussion because of the late date yeah. and what it did to the end of the year. Mm -hmm. more, mostly it's the impact on the end of the year and having snow days and getting that close literally to the 4th of July. Um, it, it causes problems. On the other hand, people just schedule vacations for the Labor Day weekend. So we just want to be open and honest about where this discussion is going. And it really was to keep the end of June non-school. Steve. Um, we're focusing on this year's calendar. Yes. I'll do my first statement there. Um, I, I do believe because of the end date, we do need to start before Labor Day this year. The yes. aspect of it. Um, the only change that I would propose would be is instead of a Thursday, Friday for the students, it would be a Wednesday, Thursday, and thus having Friday and, and Monday for, for the Labor Day weekend. Right. Yeah. Could you make that change? <laughs> <laughs> it, it is possible. It's not the two scenarios that are presented, no, but I, did, yeah. I do have a third option that would reflect that if that's consideration for the committee. I didn't want to make it more confusing for you, but so, that is possible. I, I think before Labor Day is where we should go for that. However, I do think in a secondary piece, there needs to be a much bigger discussion about the educational value of the school calendar as a whole, right? Um, you could talk to several people in the educational, in the district about what happens in June or after June 1st or after MCAS. Um, so looking at the school calendar as a whole, which involves vacations, which days off, right. what have you, I think is a much bigger discussion which definitely would under your umbrella which is the best for an educational value it's something that we need to definitely look at to not for this calendar because it's already pretty bad but something we should be looking at for future years Great. Great. Okay. anybody else well a part of that I would think I know a lot of districts have looked at eliminating the February and April yeah. vacation and having a vacation and in March, March. Mm -hmm. something by the way that I don't that I'm in favor of, but I know that's one of the things that you're referring to. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think that's what you're talking about when you say take a look at other options with regard to education, sound yeah. educational yeah. function. But it, again, just a personal opinion on that. I, I don't think getting rid of or merging the two vacation actually adds any value because you only net two day, two, three days because of the fact you have the holiday in February and holiday in April. Right. right. So you're still getting those days off. But can is there any like getting rid of February vacation, adding four day weekends in there, is there any value to that? And I think that's just an open discussion across the board. What worked, what doesn't work. The issue is getting out in June as late as we have. Yeah. And where testing happens and what happens at the end of June, what or even in June it doesn't offer any value to the education of our students. That's, I think, the biggest question. Mrs. Fox, mm -hmm. if I may. Um, for purposes of, of tonight, my suggestion would be, first of all, I did not receive any emails or texts. We clearly communicated the vote tonight. Mm -hmm. So there really shouldn't be any families who didn't know that this action was going to be taken. Right. It would be my recommendation through the chair that a motion be made about yep. one of the calendars, a second, then you can obviously continue the discussion. The discussion. Okay. Anybody in the audience? I don't know. Um, is there anyone out there who would like to talk to address the calendar? They're all in favor of whatever we pick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll certainly communicate that right out to the community mm -hmm. after tonight's on the website. and. So forth. Yeah, we, we do need to get the word out. So um, I will entertain a motion to advance one of the two options. <clears throat> Are we open to the... The oh, the other option. option three, he just put on the table. <laughs> I, I didn't. I mean, it wasn't. I would say make a make a motion on the before Labor Day if that were going to be the case, and then you could have that as part of your discussion. 
I'll make a motion you. to uh, move forward the calendar with starting school before Labor Day. <coughs> Thank you. In a second? Second. Okay, now we have discussion. Yes. The other question, why wasn't that option considered, this the option Steve mentioned earlier, it's just... I, I can give you my answer because I, I developed them. My right. feeling is that we're starting before Labor Day, we're starting before Labor Day. I don't know why we would stay clear of Friday. It's already a three-day weekend. That's my honest answer. I was also trying to not, uh, looking at professional development for my new teacher orientation, it starts to then kick into that third week in August, Derek, so... But but I but I, I do understand this community has been sensitive to that trying to have a kind of a, a four day weekend around it. Well, the community's also had school start before Labor Day, but everyone in this yeah. room is too young to remember that, so. and they didn't get four day weekends. Yeah. <laughs> so so under the current rec motion that you've made, you'd be starting school for students two days prior to Labor Day, three day weekend, then coming back in with a closed date of uh, June 18th without snow. So Steve, are you adamant about the Friday? I mean, how strongly do you feel about it? It's, I personally don't feel strongly about it, but. I, I'm just one opinion, you know what I mean? I just put that out there. Well, it's yeah. an opinion and we you respect know, uh, that. So it's just. Uh, well, we have an educator opinion over here, well, I think. <laughs> and a parent. And that, a parent. It almost feels like we're almost starting. And I, and I think people might still be tempted to take a vacation if you yeah. start and then you oh, start along with mm -hmm. I think if you're going to stop before Labor Day, you stop before Labor start. Day. Start. My... Hard start. Correct. Okay. With that being said, I'll, I'd make a motion that we accept the calendar presented that we go with the Friday before. Thursday, um, Friday. The Thursday, Friday before. Yep. I'll make a motion. I, I don't think Which would be the do, calendar as, as presented. Yeah, that would be the calendar. Second, so we're all set. So we'll, I'll call the vote then. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed. Any abstentions? Okay. Now we can do the budget. So we will make sure uh, Mrs. Fox's dad calendar is on the website. It's out to the administration. And I'll include it as part of the superintendent's corner this week as well. Good. There are really no other agenda items if you want to go through the reports and or just come back that. to that. Is everybody okay with just doing that and we'll <clears throat> spend the time on the budget and then we go? Conclude. Um, Should be pretty, pretty, pretty yeah, let's, straightforward. Yeah, let's do that if everyone's in agreement. That'd be great. We uh, don't have a, a super tense evaluation of committee update at oh, this but I did read everything you sent. <laughs> Regional um, Finance Committee meets next Wednesday. Wednesday here, 6.30. Yep. All right. And budget books will be ready for them. Yeah, Tomorrow. Tomorrow. They'll be at both, both, both town halls. They can pick them up there. All right. And <coughs> the policy we already kind of you reported out mm -hmm. on already. Um, wellness, though. Not the July, the end of this month. Okay. February 26th. All right. Okay, good. Anything uh, I, else? I don't have other business other than I just want to make note. I know we're going to come back to adjourn at, after the presentation, but our next meeting is scheduled for February 26th and it is at the middle school. You oh. will receive multiple reminders, I promise. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we got it. All right, so we can go into, if that's everything, we'll just go right now to the budget. Yeah, I don't know, um, Gene, if you or Steve want to, I know you have it at your place too, but if, if you want to move, move or, yeah, <laughs> absolutely, I'll wait just a second. So as Mrs. Fox um, finds hopefully a nice sort of location to kind of see that, I have a brief presentation tonight. I, I have the privilege of kickstarting the budget process. Um, not only do you have your, your detailed transparent notebooks, but all town officials, regional finance committee, board of selectmen, town administrator, you individuals who are here present will also receive them this week. So that's certainly our plan and we have regional finance next week. So I will, I have a brief presentation and as we've done in the past, this is the school committee's first time publicly seeing the document, uh, first time seeing the document, period. Um, so we typically have not engaged in a lot of dialogue at this meeting. It's in a, kind of an uninterrupted 15 minute presentation. 
I promise I'll keep it to that point, high, giving some highlights. It kickstarts the budget process. It's the superintendent's budget. And then obviously we have subsequent conversations and, and meetings as we, as we work towards the timeline this spring. The first, uh, the first item I certainly want to recognize the current school board, right? The chair, Gene Fox, Steve Owen, uh, vice chair. We certainly are represented by both towns. I think the strength of this committee has been the fact that your agenda has been about students. And I, uh, having been in education for 31 years, I, 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 I really respect and truly believe that the communities, certainly in my tenure here, have benefited from this committee's um, focus on what we can do and what's best for both towns in all schools. So as I then take that, that leadership from, from administration, I also just wanna recognize we have four new members of our talented leadership team uh, at central office. Uh, Dr. Pat Koblinski joins us as our director of curriculum instruction. Greg Goodwin, although Greg's not new to the district, but he certainly is new in his director of facilities, building and grounds position, joins us at central office. At the high school, we added Andrew Davey as an assistant principal town and uh, a, a new assistant principal, Brian Oliveira, to what is already a real strong team. One of my, one of, certainly one of the things I'm most thrilled about is the, the strength of this leadership team um, and their focus, and you'll see it throughout the booklet, uh, not necessarily uh, earmarked in this presentation, but in their individual budgets and their emphasis and priorities. I will not read to you our vision, but more importantly, I'd want to just point out that I have stressed in my now 60 years that a budget's a reflection of our priorities, right? So as we go through these items and we take a look, it's important to remind the community that the school board member's responsibility is to take a look at those resources that are necessary to support those priorities. I think the fact that we are a good school system can't let it get in the way of the fact that we need to be great. We need to keep raising that bar and, and, and emphasizing that this budget is an educational plan that certainly reflects those priorities. The first items I think that are important to, to, to catch in context before I present the budget number are some assumptions that we made as we started this budget process. First and foremost, the state increased aid by $30 per child. So we received an additional $84,900 in Chapter 78. Um, before we start to cheer for that, we need to take a look at the next line, recognizing that our regional transportation dollar amount is $136 less. So the total state aid that we build into the revenue for the assessment is actually less going into FY21. I don't anticipate that number. Both Ashley and I had discussions changing much. I think the one thing we'll talk about a little bit later on is the potential for some re additional regional transportation supplemental monies that should come this year that may help offset some future decisions that we have to make. But right now we're looking at a, a slight increase in Chapter 70 funds. Uh, we have to, by the way, submit a new Student Opportunity Act plan that you have to approve next month to show how we're using all that additional money um, of $84,000, yes. Um, I'm looking for the form that also talks about the reduction in regional transportation, but I haven't seen that one come, so. But, but it, just big picture, I think it's important to note as you take a look and we look at the budget, the assessment, the revenue's less, right? The, 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 money, the money's less coming into the cities, to, into the towns of Freetown and Lakeville as we build. Circuit breaker, level funded once again. Uh, we don't anticipate that changing. Uh, we certainly know what our contractual obligations are because we did not negotiate new contracts. We knew what those numbers were. We're projecting a conservative um, increase of 2.67. That's our current employees and retirees. We feel comfortable with that number, but as Ashley has been very much a part of the process, we're negotiating and taking a look at our current health plan and, that, and, and I would be remiss if I didn't say that that number could adjust either down, hopefully, but also could be increased as we work through this process. But we, we feel comfortable with the placeholder. We feel it's kind of in the middle of where we need to be. Um, it is more than we had last year. We, had a, we benefited greatly from the, the reduction in health insurance costs. And then lastly, uh, utility costs are trending upward a little bit, and we've carried that forward. And we're also, don't forget, going to be talking a little bit about performance contracting as it relates to capital and offsetting some of the cost as part of our operational budget for next year. So those are the assumptions that lead to these numbers, which, which is typically what the towns want to see, right? What, what's the budget? The recommended superintendent's budget for this coming year, FY21, is $41,496,486. Uh, 
You look at last year's voted budget, it's an increase of $1.4 million, an increase of 3.64%. Typically, when we meet with regional FinCom, they wanna see this next number. And we're gonna come back to that budget number in just a moment, right? What's the assessment as it relates to revenue coming in and offsets? Um, and you can see Freetown's assessment for FY21 projected based on the superintendent's budget of $12,239,473 and Lakeville's of $15,720,891. That's based on student enrollment and our, and our assessment formula. You can take a look at last year's assessment. You can see the dollar increases in Freetown of $726,863, Lakeville $939,123, and the increases are the bottom line there. 6.31% for Freetown. Lakeville, 6.35%. Again, budget 3.64, but the assessment, what it's costing the towns in this budget are the numbers that you see there. Just to give you some detail behind that and some context, you can take a look here at the increases to get to that 3.64% number. And you can see where most of the money is. And rightfully so in any organization that's people driven, it's gonna be in salaries and the commitment that you make to the staff. So you see the salary amount, 2.43%, $971,486,000. Um, you see technology, insurance. Those are all state-reported columns as well, Ashley, not necessarily. No, they're just, formats. just of ours. Just, okay, just portions of that piece, and you see the 3.64. Just to give you a little context of what that 3.64% looks like as we work towards the regional FinCom recommendation, hopefully next week and down the line, FY21 was increase that $1,457,901 increase of 3.64. It's pretty consistent what we've had, certainly in my tenure here, right? We've gone last year to an approved budget of 4.61%. We had two years under that. Keep in mind, some of those years, we had some significant capital costs, though, that were in incurred. So we're not including capital costs as part of the operational, but there were years that our percentage of our operational budget, which is being presented tonight, was lower, but that does not it does not include those dollar amounts that went towards some pretty, pretty significant projects that, that still hold some debt that we'll talk about in just a moment. And then obviously look down 17, you see the 4.89. So let's talk a little bit about what that number looks like. Um, and, and I think the exciting part of the budget this year is because of the recalibration that took place and some of the details, we really established some lines. Um, and, and as long as we maintain those lines, and that's going to be the real challenge this board faces as they meet with the towns, reductions in lines in maintenance and textbooks and supplies to, bring a, uh, to, to adjust the number will have an impact on programs and services. And I would caution the group, um, to, I would encourage you to maintain those lines because we've really worked hard in these last few years to build them back. But the increase on the salary line, that 2.34% that was mentioned, that reference there of FY21, includes step and schedule increases, the 2% collective bargaining increase, inclusive of retirements, we anticipate eight retirements, the um, mandatory minimum wage increases, the dollar amounts of $12.75 and then $13.50, they've, they've been, we've wrapped that into FY21. One additional grade level paraprofessional at Aswamsit, the principal actually asked for two additional paraprofessionals to address some class size and support. Uh, one additional classroom teacher at FES to address an expanded role. Uh, one additional school psychologist to address our, our ongoing concerns in relation to organization and meeting the needs of children, but also for testing purposes. And two special education teachers, one at the high school and one at Grace. These are the highlights or references to ads to what to what was had what we had previously in our FY20 budget. Everything else is being maintained and or slightly increased. Ashley, I would I, I know you have those numbers off the top. The vast majority of the 971 are captured in the first two statements: step and schedule and two percent collective bargaining. Yes, seven hundred thousand dollars over 971. So just to give you an idea of the of the 971, just over seven hundred thousand dollars are inclusive of contractual obligations as it relates to uh, the step and schedule and the collective bargaining of all of our groups. Health insurance, let's just touch upon 
health insurance, again, just briefly, I referenced the fact that we're looking at a 2.67% increase. We've talked about this, and I think probably this is a good question thinking, but that number maybe is a little bit lower than what's projected. And, and there is a risk inherent in obviously starting the process that it could be a little bit higher. We're cautiously optimistic, and we, we went out to an RFQ, and so we're, we're, we're um, looking at viable options as it relates to providing the, the appropriate benefit for our current employees and retirees, but also hopefully getting uh, a cost-efficient plan. Right now, we've built that piece in. You can see what some of the increases have been, how volatile it's been over the years in relation to uh, you know, 17, where it's 8.3. That is the high end of what, what they're projecting currently, by the way, with our plan. Up to nine. Up to it just just came back under eight eight point three right now. Yeah, it was initially. Yeah, it, it was as high as double digit initially. So that uh, we hope to have some information by the end of the month that will solidify the number. But right now, we've projected in my current budget um, two point six seven percent increase. A little bit higher on the on the current employees. A little less on the on the retiree exactly. health insurance. Correct. So transportation. Not, not significant changes here, whether it be in regular education, transportation, or special education. Some different rerouting in relation to the needs of out-of-district students relative to special education, transportation, increase of about $22,000. And the $78,460 uh, is fuel it's adjustment. A, it's a fuel adjustment and the yearly contractual obligation. Capital debt, down again. Um, and you can see the, the trend, it's still inclusive of the pool project, the track, the tennis courts, grays, and the middle school. We do not project a capital plan based on our, hopefully, what we hope to see is uh, through our performance contracting need. Special education breakdown, you can see the FY21 total budget for special education, $10,741,000. You can do that percentage piece when you look at the total budget. Um, the general fund of, of 9.4 million circuit breaker. Um, you see a, a significant reduction as it relates to that. And that, and that is more of an impact of, of, of placement. So change within. in placement means there was less tuition. So the circuit breaker amount next year will be a little bit less. So that's not, that's really reflective of your population, not necessarily um, the state not supplying the information and then grants and, and preschool 805. I won't, um, we have quite a few slides and I know you your place where it's broken down. I'm not gonna go through all the specifics on some of these enrollment charts and so forth. I'll try to hit the highlights, especially for the community that will have this presentation in your book, budget book, booklets. There's much more detail, but this outlines the special education uh, enrollment. E and D, I think it's important to, to stop here and pause for a moment as we look at the E and D slide. Our current E and D amount is six hundred five thousand four hundred forty nine dollars. Uh, we are finally trending in the right direction relative to where we were in eighteen, right? With eighty thousand dollars to eighteen previous year, six oh five. I think what's important to note, because obviously you can look to the previous years, what I think this committee has done is made a concerted effort to not use the flawed practice of, of, of E and D moving forward. So when you look at FY17 and say, well, we're just at 17, I think, well, my only response to that would be, well, the good news is we're not spending the E and D as part of the operational budget. And that was the plan. And I'm not being critical. I think the reality was there wasn't revenue available and the towns weren't supporting it. So the, di the, the district didn't have a choice at the time. And so depleted that piece. I think we're in a much better place. Although even that 605 number was a little bit lesser than we had anticipated. We were hoping for a little bit, right? More savings there. Um, I will note at this point that at some future time, whether it be at the regional FinCom or an upcoming school committee meeting, I know both um, Ashley and I would like to discuss the idea of establishment of a, of a regional transportation fund because if in fact we do receive supplemental monies, that money can go in, it, we're talking about FY19 into our 20 budget, we would receive that and you could carry that into that fund and then apply it potentially to FY21. If we don't have that fund in existence, then it would roll into e &D. It would roll into e &D. So you'd still receive the money, but we would not necessarily have the flexibility to, to have an offset for the assessment. And it's something I think we may have to explore, especially if we're trying to bridge a gap with the towns down the line. 
just something that actually doesn't need to be taken tonight, but consideration to be given. I'm a little bit more cautiously optimistic than our director of finance in relation to how much money we're actually going to receive from the state. I'd love to receive $136,000, uh, which would give us to there. Um, like Mrs. Fox's reaction, very similar to Mrs. Lopes. Uh, uh, Ashley's not convinced that we're going to see anything near that uh, in supplemental, but um, I'm cautiously optimistic, especially where we're a community that really hasn't received a lot of additional Chapter 70 money. That maybe that will be the case, but we'll hopefully have that information in the coming weeks. But E&D obviously in a much better place in FY21 as we move forward for the budget. The enrollment is listed here um, just on your, so the chart up here is correct. It's 2834, that's our October 1. I believe the printout one that you have ha actually has it correct on the graph, but has the incorrect number. So you just wanna make that calculation on your, on your booklet. I think it has last year's um, October 1 listed there. The October 1 enrollment, which is reflective in those class size charts that I give you, is actually the 2834 that you see on the, um, on the overhead here. And then just the enrollment by breakdown by town. We are seeing probably a leveling off, and really we're, we're seeing an increase at the elementary levels in, in more students, but we're seeing that kind of offset with some existing classes. Um, I think it's only a matter of time where we're going to see the trend go back up for, for students, student enrollment. We're not losing students, but, we're, but the students that are coming in are being offset by some classes leaving. But, but as you can see, over the last four to five years, it's pretty much leveled off. The idea that towns are saying we're seeing less students. Yeah, if, if you really want to look historically back at, you know, 10 years ago, you could say that. Um, in addition, obviously, here's, our, here's the uh, school choice impact. We currently have 65 students. We have built an FY21 budget of 80 students, projecting 80 students. We have eight seniors that are school choice students, so eight potential students leaving. Um, and we're projecting, and you'll be voting, or hopefully take an action at our next school committee meeting on the potential for up to 25 slots. So we've built in what we, what we believe is a conservative number, not filling all those slots, but 15 of those slots kind of moving forward in addition to the give or take. We do have some adjustments that are made. So even though we're losing eight students, what often happens is students are reclassified that are our current students and move out and remain with us and they become a school choice and it's hard to forecast that. But we typically have five or six of those students a year. We literally just had a student the other day. So they remain our students, but we do get funding for that uh, prorated based on when, when they make that adjustment. Again, I think this is important that the towns, both Freetown and Lake will understand that this has been something that is a revenue source for the community. And we've been real careful about not having it compromise your priorities around class size, specifically at the elementary level. I'm giving you a little um, preview, but in, in all likelihood, we will not be recommending um, school choice seats at the elementary again because of the, the ongoing demand for class sections. And then, then the next, I want to say, four or five slides are the class size breakdown, which I know can be a little challenging to see you have it in front of your place. And, and in each of the schools, um, Ashley, working with the principals and the leadership team, have done a phenomenal job of outlining for you folks the school community, the school board, finance, um, the regional finance committee, but also board of selectmen in each town, the breakdown of what the principals were looking for and uh, re really did a nice job of highlighting some things that are not inclusive, included in my budget, um, but that remain priorities, but we just felt comfortable that we had to have a conservative number coming in. So the class sizes I, I posted there, um, it's difficult to, at the elementary level, to take a look at um, the kindergarten numbers, it's a little bit early, you know, to, to look at census numbers, but we're projecting, again, you know, pretty high numbers in both kindergarten at Aswamsett and um, at Freetown Elementary School. This is the, the, the Austin Intermediate School. Obviously, you have uh, at the Intermediate School, for example, you have one class leaving. That's a large class, a smaller class coming in, and th those types of adjustments are made. Um, there were no additional staffing requests other than the special education teacher at the Intermediate School, just for example. Freetown Elementary, uh, free, excuse me, Freetown Lakeville Middle School. Please note new principal there. You will see multiple requests that were made by the administration that we could not incorporate um, to maintain some fiscal responsibility, but take a look at those closely. I think it does show the needs that exist there. 
Um, and, and so we, we made some nice efforts last year. The school board supported that, where we added a specialist and, and some additional pieces. But um, again, at each of the schools, you will see highlighted um, by the director of finance areas of, of concern, of priority, um, and those areas that we were not able to fund in this initial budget. And then obviously class size, the high school, which can always be a little challenging when you look at what's expected of a comprehensive high school. We obviously, we just had Dr. Starkey here. So as we conclude kind of this very brief kickoff of the budget season process, which we started months ago, right? We started in October with our leadership team and staff and, 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 and directors. Um, my budget tonight is a recommended superintendent's budget of $41,496,486, an increase of 3.64%. Looking at the timeline, I've already referenced the Regional Finance Committee meeting next Wednesday. We have some subsequent budget meetings coming up. We also, it's not even listed there, school committee meeting on, on February 26th. We've got some potential joint meetings. Please keep in mind that at the regional FinCom, the last meeting, they did discuss moving up the budget hearing, public hearing, and, and the school committee taking action uh, a little bit sooner. We do have two town meetings scheduled on June 1st, um, but I am very optimistic and pleased with the process and timeline as it relates to the input that we received. At the end of the day, um, I know we don't necessarily ask questions and answers and you're just getting the booklet. I would encourage you, there are 24 sections of like action packed details, right? And, and, and there are a whole lot of information provided through, um, through Ashley's office, consistent with last year's transparent piece, but I think she even went a little bit further and tried to provide a little bit more insight and comparison and detail uh, in her second year here. And I'm, and I'm certainly thankful to, to Renee's kind of hard work behind behind the scenes working with, uh, with, the, with my directors and, and putting this piece together, representative of the leadership team and the entire school. So uh, I do appreciate the committee's patience sitting here at the initial meeting where you kind of give me un, an uninterrupted 15 minutes to kind of roll it out. Uh, and I certainly um, understand and, and wanna communicate to, the, to both communities that maybe have some concern regarding the initial number. This is the first step in the process as it relates to working with both towns. Um, and I'll make sure that that's referenced in the superintendent's corner. This will go on the website as the superintendent's budget. Um, and obviously, um, I think we're going to have a lot of opportunities to take a look at priorities and make some adjustments and, and hopefully go into June 1st in both towns with, with full support. Mrs. Fox, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, questions for Mr. McGarrett? Mr. Owen? Um, not necessarily a question about the budget, but just the process. I think through the chair, I'd like to, you know, chunk this up a bit, whereas we have the right resources here and at our next meeting, you know, let's focus on the five school buildings. That way the principals can be here, what have you. Mm -hmm. um, and then a subsequent meeting focusing on some of these other items yeah. not that go along with it. Um, I, I, overall, the additional resources are a concern. I think we need to look at that, you know, from a, a number of perspective. Um, I have a concern about the school choice revenue number. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think personally it's high. Uh, we are assuming we're bringing in a net of 15 students to just to meet that number. Um, I, I should have noted though, there is some res residual funds that, that are carried over that are also um, part of that process. And we can talk about so that. So I'm taking that into income. consideration too, but yeah. you know, that's a number that, and, and we haven't Higher met we all of our revenue every year of that, so I think having some residual is probably not the norm that we've experienced. So uh, I think that uh, we should go back to the process that we've had the last couple of years of being more conservative of that. I know that doesn't help the bottom line of the budget, but we've been trying to keep that clean. Um, but to go back to point, I think to the chair, I'd like to... You want to suggest we do the five buildings? The five buildings, that way the principals are here for that meeting. We can focus on that allow the committee to at least to focus on those sections, notwithstanding that they can still ask offline questions through that, but. Then they may. Um, so, so Mrs. Fox, if mm -hmm. I may, I just, sure. the, so the committee, the my leadership team was asked about coming here tonight, and mm -hmm. I thought it was more beneficial because typically questions aren't asked to do exactly what you're doing to come mm -hmm. up. So they are expecting, once I get the time frame, to come to a future meeting and certainly speak to their specific budget. So. 
as long as we had no date, I actually told them to pencil in the next two co- next two school committee meetings. Quite frankly, as target dates. Depending so, on do we? Determined. Does it make sense on the twenty sixth that we do focus on that, on the five school buildings? I'll leave that to your discretion. If I, I they they know that that's the next meeting and the possibility exists that they would they would need to be present. Certainly, the middle school is going to be the host that night. Oh, that's right. That's Anybody else? Did we get through all five schools? So well, that was going to be my. Uh, it's just a start. If we have to carry over to the next one, that's you know. Hey, well, why don't, somebody yeah, I, I almost feel like it would be great to focus on the elementaries. The three. The three, and then <clears throat> we could do middle and high at another one. Or since we're going to be at the middle school, won't you? Maybe we do middle and high. <laughs> Good <Yeah>. point, <laughs> Derek. Um, my only concern is dragging this out because. We've been put to task by the town of Lakeville at the FinCom yeah. to make sure that they, they want to move their town meeting up. And so my concern is if we don't tackle these right up front, right up front mm-hmm. we may not have the sufficient amount of time. I looked at three schools just as I got this budget binder now. Ashley's done a really good job of mm-hmm. simplifying this. Last year. So I think, you can hand, I think we can handle okay. the schools. I would just recommend taking a look at it. I mean... Well, for those of us that have looked at these things before, Ashley's done a, a really nice job of making this. It's user friendly. Yeah, it, yeah this is the, the 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 budget book for dummies. Uh, it is. It's what they ask for, 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 but they're not getting. Yeah, kind of, you, you need to get your vision. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's tough. That's that's tough. I have to say, especially but, now when but, cheetahs but, are coming but into. But you're mind. absolutely right. If you look at how she's that's captured beautiful. each of those areas in the first couple of pages, which summarize the the significant changes and the dollar amounts, those are the keys. And then you obviously everything's underneath it, but. I, I don't see any reason you couldn't probably go through it as long as you came prepared and had done your piece that my principals could respond and answer questions. In some instances, as you could probably, if you've glanced at it already, in some schools there were there was very little change, right? So there may not be this any questions true. at all. So let's, I think you make a good point. We went through five last year. We can try to do the five again uh, and make apologies, but I think we should try to do our due diligence and make sure that we come with our, our questions so they only have to come to one meeting. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know if Derek and I do this quite a bit, but questions to Ashley, and she's pretty responsible. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, but it would be helpful, and obviously, to, to, to move the process <laughs> along. If you forward questions to either Ashley or to me directly, we certainly could get that, have, you know, prepared answers and anticipation of that, you know, have opportunities to talk to principals. The only thing that um, I'd, I'd ask with the questions is they, uh, if we have questions and they can be answered, but they should still be answered in, in the public session yep. so that way the public Certainly. has the benefit of understanding that. I don't care if we can go through them quickly, but I agree. they should be out in public session. That way we, you know, we, we, it's nice that we have the answer. Okay, we're all comfortable with it, but, you know, well, for, the, for, the, for the benefit of the people right. at home or watching this exciting agree. video. Um, <laughs> Well, it gives them the opportunity to prepare for those questions. Right, so, exactly. Okay. Also true. Yeah. So I will I will have all the principals in attendance. Obviously, the directors will be present as well. And At the middle school. At the middle school on the 26th. Okay. At least Good. I'll be here. I'm on the wrong spot. Let's try for um, Okay. Um, and then the only other piece would be is... Um, make sure that we have for those that have the increases the plan for that so for example the technology increases almost a 200k increase what is the plan for that um and i do think we probably need to clarify for the full school committee but the plan that we are presenting uh for it so that way everyone is on the same page yeah i didn't again that's a good example of something i didn't go into a ton of detail tonight but we'll need to be prepared to, to have conversations about with that increase for example oh especially that one i mean where we've done so much with it yes can i ask like the very first kickoff question for <laughs> for not for this meeting to answer yeah but i'd like to know if there's any capital related items in this operating budget and you don't have to answer that now we can attend to that at think the next meeting but that's going to help me look through this as well I said to find capital. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because so, yeah. yeah, I would say there are maintenance items oh, listed okay. there. 
for, for facilities and maintenance, um, there's an increase in utilities and that's it uh, because of the performance contracting yeah. Yeah. and the reduction of those utilities costs will be paying for the debt. Um, the only, we could call it capital, is the technology upgrade to the wireless system that is included in the operating budget right now. And there's a, a, a total dollar amount. I'm jumping a little bit ahead, but it's a great question. We had to build the total of technology, increase for infrastructure, even though we will receive E-rate funding. Reimbursement. Reimbursement. You have to build it in anyway. You have to build the total amount in with a reimbursement of 60? 60%. percent. Well, it's better than nothing. Exactly. We'll take it. Anybody else? Budget numb. <laughs> Again, I, I anticipate you know, we'll hear from the towns next week in relation to what they can support. Um, and I recognize I just tried to really maintain the integrity of services and programs, and I think yeah. we've done that here. Well, and Ashley spelled out what we are not including as well, so that's always appreciated. That was appreciated. No, that seems to be a good thing um, to show that we're, we're methodical and systematic, but consistent with our priorities without being frivolous. That's all good. All right. Is there anything else? These booklets will be delivered. Tomorrow? We have one town administrator here uh, that's already received his, but the, his, the, yeah. the additional um, <laughs> the additional FinCom members and selectmen will receive them in both towns, tomorrow. weather permitting, tomorrow. Oh, that's right. The next day at the latest. Now, tomorrow I do have to go to Boston. <laughs> could, could be an interesting commute early on. Yes. Here I think we'll be okay. I have one. Sure. Um, when we get to the um, special ed component, can we also bring attention to the special ed transportation? I know we've had some changes That's over the last idea. couple of years we have, some direction to do that. Figure uh, out the impact of the budget. Yep. Um, and then I have a second question outside of the budget. Could we just get a quick update on the RFQ? Sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, we actually received our responses today. We had four vendors uh, submit responses for qualification. Um, and in the next three days, we'll be going through those. Uh, we start today, Greg and I, and Nate Darling will be joining us tomorrow. And we will be selecting our vendor uh, by Tuesday next week. So by regional FinCom, you will have a, a recommended vendor. Please. Pleasantly pleased. We, expect, we anticipated a couple, but... Four is pretty good. Four is pretty good. That's that's the. Positive. So we'll have some. So we'll have some updated information at Regional FinCom next Wednesday, and certainly for our next meeting on the twenty sixth. If you're selecting the person, that's not any contract with them, correct? No. Uh, well, well, we go. Well, we go through all of the binders and we look at their qualifications and what sh what meet our needs and who we would like to work with. It has nothing to do with the dollar amount of any kind of work being done. From there, we would discuss in this committee going forward with the audit, and that's when we would go into a contract with the vendor. That audit would be factored into the cost that we would um, go out for financing for. So it wouldn't be included in our operational budget this year. I think we're, I was estimating around $45,000. Mm -hmm. That would be rolled into the debt. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Don't all speak at once. Okay, I guess we're good. So um, if there's no further business to come through the committee. I do not have any. I will entertain motion. a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right.